Good morning, and Rupesh, thank you for inviting me to speak today. What I wanted to do um, was really to set what's happening in Kerala in the context of what's happening internationally around the Responsible Tourism Movement. I think you begin to understand how significant what has happened here in Kerala is, but I want to make sure that by the end of my presentation you've completely understood how important what is happening here in Kerala is to the Responsible Tourism Movement internationally. I think the, the presentations we've heard already this morning demonstrate why I should not be allowed to speak about responsible tourism in Kerala. It's developing very rapidly, it's very diverse, it's very inventive, and there are a lot of people now driving responsible tourism forward. But I want to take you back to where we were when all this started and to put it in the context of why I became as anxious as I did about the future of tourism and the future of our planet. So I'm going to talk about the challenge of sustainability, talk about what responsible tourism is, about where it came from, the origins of it. I want to talk specifically about the difference between sustainable and responsible tourism. Then I'm going to talk about responsible tourism in Kerala, then about the awards and finally to make some comments about the future as I see it. So I'm going to speak for about 45 minutes and I apologise for that. It's being videoed because I want to use this internationally to sing the praises of Kerala, but also to explain to a global audience where responsible tourism came from, why Kerala has played such an important part in the fostering and development of responsible tourism and then to talk about the future uh, which I hope is bright but we'll see. So first of all on the sustainability challenge. 1972 I was a young undergraduate student at the University of York in England studying politics and international politics and that year saw the World Commission on environment and development meet for the first time under the auspices of the UN. We've known since 1972 that we had a problem as a species, that we were taking too much out of the environment and that we were becoming unsustainable. 2012, I'm coming to the end of my working life. We're at Rio plus 20, and to be honest, we've made very little progress in that 40 years. So, the, sorry, not 30 years, 40 years of my working life. So, the question now is, what happens next? 50 years on, we had the Limits to Growth published in 1972. It wasn't mentioned in my university course. People um, didn't talk about it. I still have a copy of that book because I saw it in the Sunday Times newspaper. The reality is that when I saw it, I thought, we won't be that stupid, will we, as a species? We're bright as human beings. We're not going to make those mistakes. And they had some projections of what would happen to our planet if we went on as we were in 1972. The reality is that what research has been done demonstrates that, in fact, the, the forecast made by the scientists 1972, for all that they seemed ridiculous in 72, nearly all of them have been achieved, much to the detriment of our planet. Over tourism is one example of us living unsustainably on this planet. This is the research that's been done, you can look it up, I've given you the full references, but basically this subsequent research demonstrated that in fact those forecasts which people laughed about in 1972 have largely come true. And you can see, here's one example. This is carbon and climate change. This is the data from Hawaii. And what it shows is the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere just goes on and on up. We haven't even dented it. I know people talk about how COVID reversed this trend, but it's simply not true. The trend has gone on and on. It has not been dented at all. Same with plastic waste. 
I very much admire what Kerala has done to reduce the amount of plastic waste. You can see what happens. It goes into the watercourses, it goes into the oceans, it creates these giant gyros. And now when I eat fish in the UK, I'm actually ingesting microplastic as I eat the fish. We really have polluted our environment in dramatic ways. We've entered the Anthropocene, a period when geologists, if there are any in the future, look back, they'll see the impact of us as a species on the geological record, partly because of the plastic, which will be there for thousands of years. So let's go back to the definition of sustainability, which came from the Brundtland Commission report. And they talked about sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And we all clapped and said, of course we won't do that. Then we went and did it. And we're now, partly because of the Ukraine war, but not only because of the invasion of the Ukraine, we're beginning to bump up against the limits of development on our finite planet. And that has serious consequences for all of us, most notably at the moment in Europe, where people no longer expect their children to have a better standard of living than they had. My parents certainly expected me to have a better standard of living than they did, and I did. But that will not be the case for future generations in Europe. We've lost that perspective that the, better, the future will be better for our children and our grandchildren. We're failing to distinguish between what we really need and what we want, and we're failing to, to recognize that we live in a finite world where we can't just have more and more of everything. Tourism is itself, of course, a polluting industry. You know that very well. It was a big issue, 2000 to 2007, here. There's greenhouse gas emissions associated with the, with the travel. In the destination, you get litter and trampling, all of which has a management cost. You get congestion in the public realm. Fortunately, in Kerala, your tourism is very dispersed. It's not as big a problem here as it is in many places. You get the social and economic impacts on the high streets and the villages where people can no longer find locally sourced goods for their own consumption. Again, that hasn't happened in Kerala. But then you get the induced effects, the migration, the second homes and the holiday lets. And holidays in much of uh, tourism villages in much of the UK and other places in Europe have been hollowed out by second homeowners. And there's the beginnings of that in Kerala, although it's not as in any way the kind of problem that it is in Europe. Now, as Sir Colin Marshall, who was then uh, chairman of British Airways in 1994, when he launched the Tourism for Tomorrow Awards, really let the cat out of the bag. Because he said, when he, when he opened those awards, he made the point, which is the one they like to quote, about the importance of keeping these products fresh and unsullied, not just for the next day, but for every tomorrow. And that's the bit of the quote which is often used. The more significant part of the quote is the part in bold. That the travel and tourism industry is essentially the renting out for short-term lets of other people's environments. The problem is that the main beneficiary of those short-term <coughs> lets are the accommodation providers, the tour operators and the airlines. And that was perceived as quite a big problem in Kerala. I'll come back to how it was solved, and I think to a large extent it was solved here. But it hasn't been solved in other places. I was working in Slovenia in 1997, and around the parliament building in Ljubljana, um, a poster went up in Slovenian, it's translated there, but basically the slogan said, your everyday life is someone else's adventure. And that is very much the reality, I think, of tourism to Kerala. People come here not to see the Taj, not to see the Red Fort, but they come here to see the way people live in harmony with the environment and the way they've done that for generations. And that's what makes Kerala special. It's that opportunity to interact with the local community. 
And some of the products which the Responsible Tourism Mission has developed here absolutely give reality to that. The village life experience is one of the best tourism experiences you can have anywhere in the world if you're interested in how local people lead their lives and make their economy work. Now the photograph on the right I took. I'm embarrassed by that photograph. It was actually taken in Rajasthan, some of you may recognise the costume. Taken in Rajasthan when I hadn't really thought about responsible tourism. I was just taking very wealthy tourists around the world having a great time as a tour leader. And we went on something called a village safari. Can you imagine that? They still use that language in Rajasthan. A village safari. And we went to a village because, frankly, if you're at a tiger reserve looking to see tigers, there's not much to do in the middle of the day. So what do you do with the tourists? Take them on a village safari. Basically, you turn up in your motorised vehicle, drive through the village, and take photographs of people having a haircut or making baskets or whatever it is that they're doing in the village. Shocking form of tourism, I now realise. I'm embarrassed. I did ask permission to take that photograph of women who were dressed up to go to a wedding. I did ask permission, but I didn't tell them I was going to show it all around the world uh, as my example of my own embarrassment about behaviour in my past. But I'm embarrassed by that. The point is, that kind of tourism is really what so many people are interested in. Now in Kerala you do it really well because you have the village life experience. It's done very well in the townships in South Africa when you go in in the back of a small vehicle with a local guide who takes you to places where he is paying the people you are visiting. But it's done very badly as well in South Africa. Let me give you a, a personal example of that. I'd been invited to meet with an elderly lady and she was elderly, she was in her 70s. She was about to open up her house to do meals for tourists as a way of creating an income for herself. Her, her, her husband had died, so she really needed to make an income. We had a chat for about half an hour and she came off to see me, came out to see me off as we left. And along came a large 50-seater coach, full of people who stood at the windows taking photographs of the old lady and me. Uh, from the inside their coach, their air-conditioned coach, and she turned to me and she said, they think we're animals. They were just taking photographs in the same way that they would have taken photographs of lions or zebra. It's a pretty shocking thing to be on the receiving end of that kind of tourism. Tourism concern, which sadly no longer exists in the UK, ran a campaign for many years pointing out that we take our holidays in other people's homes. And that part of the point of that is that tourism is unusual because the consumer travels to the destination, the factory if you like, to consume the product. So that is both an invasion and an intrusion, but it's also an opportunity. Because the fact that the tourist comes much closer to the producer means that they see the working conditions, or at least some of them, but more importantly, perhaps, there are opportunities for the sale of additional goods and services and complementary products from the local community to those tourists. And that's been a big focus of what the Responsible Tourism Mission has done here in Kerala and what Responsible Tourism practice involves around the world. I put this in because it, in part it explains why I got involved in Responsible Tourism. I got really angry seeing this kind of poster put up. And it's really what's wrong with ecotourism, which I regard as most of the time, there are good examples of ecotourism, but most are not. Most are just another form of exploitative tourism. The very idea that you should kill nothing but time, take nothing but pictures, and leave nothing but footprints is anathema to me. It's completely wrong. As a British person, I'm asking people in India or Africa 
to live with dangerous wildlife which occasionally kills people, to give up land which they could use for their own sustainable development, to conserve wildlife. And here I am coming from a country where we've killed all of ours. We've killed all the bears. We've killed them all. Well, we're in luck that this is on a different system. So that's what got me involved really in thinking about how you could change tourism for the better. That you had to leave some money behind to compensate communities for giving up the opportunities that that resource would give them for their livelihoods. So the problem I see now is people keep talking about sustainable and responsible tourism as though they're the same thing and they are not the same thing. Sustainability is abstract. It's a general aspiration perhaps that we should be able to continue to live on this planet. Now the reality is that many business people when I talk to them, not in Kerala but in many other places, say something is sustainable if they expect they can still be doing it next year. That's sustainability, being able still to make a profit from doing it next year. But it has to be more than that. It has to be about the future and it has to be about our children and our grandchildren. The other thing I'd say which is really important is that people engage with particular issues. Sustainability is not something that people want to engage with. Stopping children being trafficked to go into orphanages, enabling local people to have a better standard of living, engaging with the craft workers and buying directly from them, that's something that people can relate to. Sustainability is too abstract for people to get excited by it. I'd also say that the issues vary from place to place. In Kerala, the two issues which really mattered in 2007 was the pollution being caused by people dropping litter and oil in the lakes, particularly in the backwaters, and the other issue was the fact that local communities were not benefiting from tourism. They were having all the negative impacts, but none of the positive benefits. It's very clear what the issues were in Kerala, and the, the issues do vary from place to place. The issues are always local. And it means that if you're going to make real change, there has to be political engagement. As Rupesh was saying earlier, it has to be government, the private sector and communities working together. It won't be achieved by any one of those groups acting on its own. We've made way too little progress since 1972. As it happens, I haven't had any children, so I don't have to worry about my children, but I worry about other people's children and what the world will be like 50 years from now. So what is responsible tourism? I think it's very simply said that it's about using tourism to make better places for people to live in. It's about using tourism to achieve sustainable development. Sustainable development through tourism. So the aspiration of responsible tourism is to use tourism rather than to be used by it. Now that particular formulation works really well, particularly with politicians. The idea that they are going to help their community to use tourism rather than be used by tourism is, in my experience, one of the best ways of engaging the politicians in this process. What's also happened is that national tourist offices and tourist boards are moving from simply promotion to marketing. And probably the best example of that is in Barcelona, but there are other places doing it too. Using marketing as a management tool now, not just promotion, but actually using it to get the right kind of guests in the right kind of places. So that the disruption to the local community is low and the economic benefit to the community is high. Now, further east, you often hear that proverb, which is there in red. Tourism is like a fire. You can use it to cook your food or it can burn your house down. You have to manage it just like you have to manage the lamp. Yeah? It's really important that tourism is managed. And to do that, you have to engage government. Now, I'd like at this point just to acknowledge um, our friend here from the Panchayat, who was really far-sighted in seeing what tourism could mean for your community. And I applaud you for it. Um, you had a very significant impact on the development of tourism through that local level of governance. And when you combine local governments through the Panchayat 
with the state level government, you begin to have real serious impact and your role in that should be widely recognised. Very important part of why responsible tourism has been successful in Kumara Quorum and elsewhere. So what is it? It's a triple bottom line approach to tourism management. It's about economic, social and environmental. It's a way of travelling. So tourists can adopt a responsible way of travelling, but they, the tourists won't change the way the industry works. That's a great myth, and I see it being promoted in India. I'm sorry to see that. People thinking that responsible travel is about the way the tourists behave. It isn't. It's about the way in which tourism is managed by the private sector, by the communities, and by government. It is not the responsibility of the tourists to make tourism sustainable. It's a movement involving all kinds of different people. It's diverse, it's different in different places, and thank goodness for that. And very importantly, it's characterised by transparency. And I'd like here just to acknowledge what Rupesh has achieved with the Responsible Tourism mission here, where what the mission achieves is reported every year transparently on the ministry, on the, on the Kerala Tourism website. Very important that that goes on um, across Responsible Tourism. It's becoming the most important part of the process because more and more people are using responsible tourism as greenwashing. Most importantly, it, it requires the acceptance that you have a responsibility to make tourism better, in whatever way it needs to be made better in different destinations. So why this word responsibility? Because it's focused on responding and acting. It requires action. It's critical to creating change that we take action. It won't happen otherwise. It won't happen just by mouthing sustainability as the objective. It requires a serious think about what it is you're doing and how it can be made more sustainable. We'll come back to that in more detail in a minute. All forms of tourism can be more responsible. All forms of tourism can be totally irresponsible. So ecotourism can be more responsible or irresponsible. It can be both. Just by attaching the label doesn't make it responsible. So destinations are changing what they focus on. They're focusing far more on yield now and attracting market segments which work with the local community. So if you've got a destination which is into 24-hour partying, as some parts of Ibiza or Mallorca are, then you attract that kind of market to those places. But if your destination is a rural destination as Kerala is, then you market to a different market segment. It's about getting the right kind of tourist in the right place so that they have a good holiday and come back and recommend it, but also so that the community gets the most out of those visitors. One of our big challenges right now is countering greenwashing. Tourist needs to be able to experience that difference and the destination needs to be able to demonstrate that difference. Now if you come to Kerala, it's increasingly obvious that you're in a very different kind of destination to, for example, if you went to Goa, which is a very, very different tourist experience. I've actually never been to Goa, so I'm speaking from what I know of pe what people tell me about Goa but Goa is not on my list of places I want to go to. Kerala is very high on my list of where I want to go, which is why I've been here so many times. So, what do we mean by responsible? And there's, there's two, two aspects to this. There's the bit that people don't like, and in every culture, the balance between these two words and what the word means varies. On the one hand, it means you're accountable. You are the responsible. It is your fault, Rupesh, if something doesn't happen. People don't like that meaning of responsibility. Um, but it is part of it, undeniably. But the other part is the response ability, which is the opportunity you have to step up to the plate and say, I'm going to sort this. There's a problem here. I can make a difference. And that's what all of you, I think, in this room probably feel when you look at a problem, you say, what can I do to help fix this? What, how can I use tourism to make lives better in the neighbouring communities to where I do business? How can I make it better? 
I quote the link, I use the Lincoln quote a lot because I think it's really important that we understand that you cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by invading it today. You can't just keep putting it off. That's what we've done with carbon emissions. We've kept saying, oh, we'll fix that next year. The reality is now that Europe is burning. It's no longer just a, quote, third world developing country problem. It's struck back now at the hearts of Europe and America. The realization perhaps growing slowly that we have to do something to address this now. We can't keep putting it off. In a way, it's the ostrich problem. People stick their head in the sand and hope the problem will go away or somebody else will solve it. Just to be fair to ostriches, they stick their head in the sand in order to get stones to put into their gut because that's necessary to the digestion of the food. They have a good reason to stick their head in the sand. We do not. We cannot keep leaving it to other people to solve the problem. So where does it come from? Rupesh, you keep saying that I'm the father of responsible tourism, and he's completely untrue. Let me just place that on the record. The man who originated this idea was um, Jost Krippendorf, who was a German academic and briefly worked in tourism. And he talked about the way in which we needed rebellious locals and rebellious tourists to make tourism work. So there's a tradition of this focus on responsibility which dates back really to Krippendorf's work in, in the 1980s. I've picked up on that and continued it, but the father of responsible tourism genuinely is Jost Krippendorf. What Jost realised was that the main way we would get change in tourism was because consumers would increasingly demand it. And that is what tourists have done. But he also thought that people rebelling against the kind of tourism that was being offered would, almost, would also make a difference. Both tourists demanding something different and local communities out on the streets protesting about tourism. And we'll come back to that uh, shortly in relation to, to Kerala. So here's the, the graphic, which I actually used in 2002 at that international, the first international conference on responsible tourism in destinations. And you can see that we were able to trace that principle of sustainability and the desirability of people taking responsibility back to the UNWTO's Global Code of Ethics. We didn't discover it. We just thought it'd be a good idea to do it rather than simply to talk about it. And on that original slide, it actually said, you cannot outsource that responsibility. It's your responsibility as much as it is anyone else's. The problem is, when it's everybody's responsibility, you can see all those stakeholder groups across the bottom of that graphic. When it's everybody's responsibility, there's a serious risk that it will be nobody's. The other thing, which was not on the original graphic, because I didn't think it would be necessary, is it's not enough the it's not enough to say that it's primarily the responsibility of the traveller and the holiday maker, which is what more and more government policies are saying. That's not enough. What the industry does is to provide the options that the tourists choose from. It's really the producers who need to take that responsibility and the government's working with the producers and the local communities to say, in our community, the one you represent, this is the kind of tourism we want, these are the kind of offers we're going to make because that's the kind of tourism we want. This is the 2002 definition. It's about to be slightly updated, but it still stands. It's about minimising the negative impacts, environmental, social and cultural, it's about generating greater economic benefits for local people and enhancing their well-being. It's been fundamental to the Kerala model from the beginning. It involves local people in decision making. And I have to, I have to take my hat off to the Panchayats because it was here that that happened for the first time in Kerala. That's the bit of the Responsible Tourism um, Declaration from 2002 which has been least implemented around the world. The fourth thing is it has to make 
a positive contribution to the conservation of the natural and cultural heritage. Fifth, clearly important that people enjoy it and make meaningful connections. And I think, Rupesh, you've achieved that brilliantly with the Responsible Tourism Mission. It has to provide access for people with, who are differently abled. India is an absolute global leader in this. The places like Lemon Tree Hotels are extraordinary in what they've achieved in that area. And it has to be culturally sensitive and based on respect. Kerala, I think, manages that very well. So what is responsible tourism? It's very hard to define because it varies from place to place. But the important thing is that it always looks at the triple bottom line, economic, social and environmental. It's not just about the environment. It's a movement, it's diverse, and it's a way of travelling. The most important thing I think now is the transparency because it's that that stops it being used for greenwashing. Um, I think it's really exciting the way in which the Responsible Tourism Mission here in Kerala publicly reports what's being done and what's being achieved right down to the individual rupees uh, which are being earned by the mission and its members. So it really requires, and I'm preaching to the converted here I know, but it, it requires acceptance of responsibility and the willingness to act. And that's why there's such a big difference between it and sustainable tourism. They're not the same thing. Sustainability is a very abstract long-term goal, whereas responsible tourism is about taking action now. It's the difference between an, act, an abstract aim, which you don't need to bother to implement, and what you need to do to achieve it. I can't emphasize that enough. And Kerala really does have now thousands, possibly tens of thousands of people engaged in positively making tourism better for the benefit of local communities. It's responsibility that will drive sustainability and that's why we've made so little progress over the last 40 years. People have not taken responsibility to make the changes. But in Kerala they have. So, it's about what you do and how you move it forward. Now you'll see here that we've now got the first specific Kerala reference with the, uh, the logo that was used for the 2008 um, conference here in Kerala. The other trend which has been happening is this growth of experiential tourism which has really helped responsible tourism along we know it must be true because this, these are, there are two publications from the Harvard Business School uh, telling us that we're moving from a focus on value for money to a focus on experience for money. And let me give you, a, 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 again, a personal um, marker for that. When I was running a tour operation, which I ran for two years, we would sell lots of three-week holidays, three-week trips. were not unusual then from Europe. Now it's a very unusual thing to see a three-week trip partly because Europeans have become less wealthy, but it's also because they want to pay more for stronger experiences. It's no longer a question of just getting on a plane, coming to Kerala and flopping in the sun for two weeks at a very cheap price. If they're traveling now, they very often want far more than that. They want memorable experiences, not just the experience of, of lying in the sun and eating fish and chips, which was the model of tourism that satisfied my parents. The growth of the experience economy has been much to the advantage of responsible tourism and of Kerala, I think. What you really want is to create memories between the traveller and the people in the destination because it's those memories that people go back and talk about that generates the word of mouth recommendations which are so important to the development of tourism. That's what gives you viral marketing. It's the, it's the most valuable thing in tourism promotion that you can have. It's people coming because it's been recommended by their friends. You should, as Justin Francis pointed out in one of my classes, Justin went on to create ResponsibleTravel.com, which before COVID was growing at a very high rate year on year, and it's still growing now as we come out of COVID. You should be able to tell the difference if you have a responsible tourism holiday. It should feel different. And once you've had that experience, you want to have more of it. So, 
The business case is, is, I think, well known, but I thought I should just refer to it. The most important reason for doing it is because it's simply the right thing to do. It minimises risk, gives you licence to operate. It would be impossible to run many of these uh, hotels and resorts in Kerala if the local community became hostile. They could quite easily make it very difficult for you to operate. It gives you higher product quality because you've got that local experience. You get cost savings. You get staff morale, staff who want to stay because they see that there's value to their community and their families in what they do. And there's market advantage, and the market advantage is listed there. Um, it's a very powerful business case for responsible tourism, which more and more people now recognise in the industry, including major operations like TUI, EasyJet. I absolutely have that point of view now. So there's a broad consumer trend towards wanting the experience and the authenticity. Very, very strong, very evident across much of our consumerism now around the world. And of course that applies to travel and tourism as well. Authenticity is a new strain of consumer desire, say the academics at Harvard. And I think that's right. Very clear that that's the case. So let's come briefly to Kerala because I'm not from Kerala, I don't have the knowledge of Kerala that you do, I'm not the best qualified person in the room to talk about the history of responsible tourism in Kerala. Probably the guy who is, is sat on the platform, but he hasn't done it. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge the incredible role that Dr. Venu, who was then the Secretary of Tourism, uh, he'd taken up the role in 2006 and he was Secretary of Tourism until 2011. It was Dr. Venu who decided to take the risk of organising the second international conference on responsible tourism in destinations, six years after the first one in 2008 here in Kerala. And the point that came out of that really was that we had over 500 people there. There were people who'd been doing things around what had become the Responsible Tourism Agenda from around the world. Now, I was looking back recently at that conference declaration from 2008, and it was really a summary of what had been achieved around the world in different places, particularly in terms of local economic development, which rapidly emerged during that conference as one of the two central problems in Kerala that needed to be addressed. The first was ensuring that local communities benefited from the tourism which was invading their villages. And secondly, the importance of clearing up the litter and the rubbish that the tourists left behind. And they became the two founding principles of responsible tourism in Kerala. Now, the thing I like to remind Rupesh of is that that is the only conference which I've chaired or co-chaired where there was actually a demonstration against the conference taking place. There was a big-ish demonstration, not big by Indian standards, but certainly big by European standards, against the very idea that you could have a conference on responsible tourism, that the idea was crazy, could not be achieved. And people said of us that you're just trying to bring yet more tourism to Kerala through the back door by pretending that it will be responsible. It was quite nerve-wracking, that conference. Rupesh assures me that it was inside the conference, but I know he might have wanted to be outside. Um, anyway, whatever. It was an important moment, I think, for Kerala, because what came out of it was the experiments. Now, I can't speak highly enough of this. I know of nowhere else except Barcelona, where people have had actually experiments before they've committed to a major program. Between 2008 and 2010, there were four village experiments in Kovalam, Kumarakum, Takadi, and Wayanad. What was interesting is that the really successful one was Kumarakuram. And out of that came the realization that there were probably three things that needed to happen with responsible tourism in the state producer groups to make sure that communities could come together, there'd be sufficient small farmers coming together to be able to guarantee the supply of whatever it was from the local farms, whether that was 
food or craft product for the hotel. So producer groups became a key part of the strategy. The second key part was the village life experiences. Now, for both of these, there are some antecedents, there are some examples uh, elsewhere in the world, I'll come back to those, but they were clearly the important things that came out from the 2008 conference. That and the importance of avoiding dependence. Interestingly, uh, Rupesh, I'm being asked by Adama whether we can arrange an invitation for the minister from the Gambia to come out and meet with the minister from Kerala so that the minister from the Gambia can learn from Kerala in the same way that Kerala, in a way, learned from the Gambia the first time round. And I think these south-south exchanges are an important part of how we see responsible tourism develop in the future. So that's something else we need to talk about while I'm here. But the two things which I think it most demonstrated for me was first of all this massive change with households, whether they were directly engaged in tourism or not, recognising that tourism now benefited their community. So tourism went from something which was outside, of no benefit to them, became something that was very valuable to them, whether they were directly involved in tourism or not. Incidentally, nobody else has ever done this kind of census. Typical of Kerala, they want to get things done thoroughly. But the other thing it showed was the importance of not being entirely dependent on tourism. Seeing, to, seeing tourism as an additional livelihood. So one or two people in the household being dependent on tourism, but not the whole household. Very important to the sustainability of those households uh, when tourism dried up, as it did during COVID. Then 2017, we get the founding of the Responsible Tourism Mission. Now let's, let's just pause a minute. That's nine years on from the conference. Period of experiment, period of rolling out. Then in 2017, after the census proved that it made a difference, then we get the Responsible Tourism Mission and the decision by the state government to roll it out to recognise that tourism was a, was a, had a development role for villages and communities in eradicating poverty and giving emphasis to female empowerment. And that's where the mission comes from. Well grounded in practical experiments, written up, researched, evidenced, and then you get the change at the government level. and really great experiences for tourists which people talk about and encourage others to do. I'm not going to talk about the detail of what has been achieved except to say that it is genuinely extraordinary. You only have to look at the Responsible Tourism Mission pages on the Kerala Tourism website to see the strength and the public reporting of what's been achieved. PEPA, which I'm, I think, going to see some of the PEPA initiatives here while I'm in Kerala, um, is a brilliant example. And what I particularly liked about PEPA, Rupesh, when you published this, is it becomes a kind of handbook for other people who might want to replicate what you've done. And that, I think, this transparency, this commitment to sharing, is one of the things that the Responsible tour Tourism Movement really um, appreciates. This very important thing about having diversity, not every village, not every household in the village trying to do the same thing. If you do that, all you do is drive down the price. Really important to have diversity in these village life experiences. And then the one I, I think I'm definitely going to see, Rupesh, which is this street initiative. Um, sustainable, tangible, responsible, experiential, ethical tourism. My goodness, what a set of words to set alongside tourism. Extraordinary commitment. What we've seen, and it's every time I come to Kerala, I go home and I think, I don't know what I'd do next if I was in Kerala. What would I do that would be different? 
and I go away and I come back a year later and something new has been added. The, the, the kind of creativity and innovation in Kerala around this agenda is genuinely extraordinary. Um, there's always something new. I mean, that happens to me when I go to uh, Coconut Lagoon. I go there and I, I, I puzzle and test myself. What would I come up with that would be new, that could be more responsible at Coconut Lagoon? I go back there this year, two years since I was there, and now there is kayaking on the, on the, uh, on the lake so that you get much closer to nature and you have that silent experience. Brilliant. I wish I'd thought of that, but I didn't. Um, it's that this creativity is really strong in Kerala's responsible tourism approach. Then we get the awards. Now, I wanted just to pause at this point and recognise that there's only five of these ever been awarded. They're quite difficult to win because you have to have won a Responsible Tourism Award multiple times and you have to have been recognised by different juries. So it's actually quite difficult to get one of these. There have only five been awarded over the years. Two of them are from India and they're both from Kerala. Joe's Dominic and Rupesh. Now you all know about Rupesh's contribution, so let me just say a little about Joe's. Joe's, I don't think responsible tourism in Kerala would have been anything like as successful as it's been without the model of the CGH Earth Hotels and without your involvement in the private sector in saying this is good for business. And I think we should just recognise that really important contribution from CGH Earth Hotels and yours in particular at that time and the way that Michael is continuing that tradition. It's been a really important part of why Responsible Tourism has worked in Kerala. We've had the Ministry under successive Ministers and different Directors. We've had the Mission working with the Ministry. We've had the Panchayats all over Kerala seeing how important this is. But we've also had the private sector understanding why it's good for business. And I have to tell you that isn't the case everywhere in the world. There's still lots of places where I go and people say, ah, but we can't afford it. And I say, well, actually, I don't think you can afford not to do it because this is the future of tourism, unless you want to be just selling beds and sunshine. But there's an awful lot of competition in the beds and sunshine market. And frankly, the way the weather is now in the UK, you probably don't need to leave the UK to get sunshine. We have too much of it there. The awards focus on solutions. Um, they've been going a long time. The consequence of having this big bank of responsible tourism solutions is that I'm launching through the Responsible Tourism Partnership a platform for change which just brings together good examples, proven examples of how you can make tourism better across the whole agenda, environmental, social and economic. Inevitably, Kerala is going to be there a lot. You'll be pleased to know we're nearly at the end. We're going to talk about the future. So this year is the 20th anniversary since the Cape Town Declaration. We've now got regional awards in Africa, India, Latin America and the rest of the world. We've got the Global Responsible Tourism Awards where the gold winners from each of those <coughs> regional awards go forward. And in London, we will be, on the 20th anniversary, there will be a new declaration on responsible tourism. The reason that is necessary is because, to my shame, we didn't include decarbonisation in 2002. It wasn't a big issue. It's hard to believe that now, but it wasn't. We didn't have anything on extinction, biodiversity extinction, and the language, frankly, around um, enabling access for the differently abled was, to say the least, clumsy. And it's been an embarrassment to me for 20 years. So I'm determined in 2022 to be rid of that and there'll be a 2022 declaration on responsible tourism which will not be attached to any institution or geographical space. It will be a standalone um, manifesto for the movement. So that's the platform for, for, for change. We've entered the critical decade. Um, 
we've got to counter greenwashing, which is still rampant in our industry as it is in others. We need transparent reporting. And okay, there'll still be certification, but we need to know what individual businesses are achieving. Just having a certificate is no longer enough. We need government action to deal with the laggards who undermine progress. And we need partnerships for change. And most important of all, we need to remember, never mind the patter, watch the hands. It's not what people say, it's what they do that matters. And there's far too much just talking about it and not doing it. Not in Kerala. There's a bit of that in Kerala, but not a lot. So responsible tourism is now spreading across India. I'm going this, while I'm here this time, I'm going to Madhya Pradesh and Maharashtra and uh, ending in Delhi at Amity University. It's absolutely clear that responsible tourism has originated in India in Kerala. It's been taken up on very much the same model by Madhya Pradesh and it is going to be taken up, I think, in Maharashtra, although that is still not certain. But it's very exciting to see what's happening there. I thought I'd put this up because um, as a school child we had those maps of the world which showed the Mediterranean as being at the crossroads of the world and there's much talk about Venice and Malta um, in that regard. I think it's really important to recognise that Kerala was also a crossroads of the world uh, for a significant period of time in its history. So. What are the world's two leading destinations for responsible tourism? Well, the answer is it's Barcelona on the Mediterranean coast and Kerala on the shores of the Arabian Sea. That's the first thing that they have in common. They're both on the sea. They're both open to the world. But what else do they have in common? Well, they definitely have rebellious locals. Kerala had demonstrations against the conference. 2015, there were serious demonstrations on the streets of Barcelona against tourism, which affected the outcome of the 2015 um, elections in the city of Barcelona. So rebellious locals, very important. Local people should go on, if I might say so. Local people must go on demanding more. It's their role. Yeah? The other thing about that Kerala and Barcelona have in common is very strong local government, democratic local government. Sadly, that's not true most places in the world. But it does seem to me now, reflecting on the progress that's been made in different places around the world, strong democratic local governments played a key role in Kerala, clearly, but also in Barcelona. The origins and the reasons that they have that strong democratic local control is different. But the objective fact that they do is a common thing between them. The third thing is a commitment to transparency. You see that in Barcelona, which has an observatory on tourism. You see it with the responsible tourism mission here in Kerala. And the fourth thing is combining the marketing with the management of tourism. Not seeing the marketing of tourism as just being about promotion, but seeing the marketing of, as being about bringing the right kind of tourists to the right place to make it better for the local community and better for the tourists. It's a very virtuous circle if you can make that happen. That is what I wanted to say. Thank you for the opportunity to say it. And I'd like just to finish by congratulating you all on what Kerala has achieved for the responsible tourism movement. Barcelona has shown how you can do it for cities, but you've shown how you can do it for large geographical areas, and I really applaud you for it. Thank you. <laughs>